1925, Mahatma Gandhi wrote the following words. I find a solace in the Bhagavad Gita that I miss even in the Sermon on the Mount. When disappointment stares me in the face, and all alone I see not one ray of light, I go back to the Bhagavad Gita. I find a verse here and a verse there, and I immediately begin to smile in the midst of overwhelming tragedies. And my life has been full of external tragedies. And if they have left no visible, no indelible scar on me, I owe it all to the teachings of the Bhagavad Gita. In this passage that I've just quoted, Mahatma Gandhi was referring to what is perhaps the most famous of all the spiritual classics in India, the Bhagavad Gita, or Bhagavad the Lord Gita Song, the Song of the Lord. It is spelled B-H-A-G-A-V-A-D, Bhagavad Gita, G-I-T-A. The song of the Lord. The Lord in this case being Sri Krishna, who in Hindu mythology is regarded as an incarnation, an embodiment, in the Sanskrit language, an avatar of Vishnu, the Supreme Lord, the personification of the ultimate reality underlying this universe. The Bhagavad Gita was probably compiled about the 5th century BC and it forms a part of a great epic called the Mahabharata. It's attributed to a sage by the name of Yasa and contains a complete epitome of the whole central doctrine of Hinduism known as the Vedanta. It's a very fascinating and to us puzzling fact that Gandhi Preeminently the man of non-violence in modern time was so devoted to this book. Because the scene with which the book opens is a battlefield, the field of Kuru, where a young prince by the name of Arjuna is riding in his chariot and Sri Krishna, the incarnation of Vishnu, is his charioteer. As the opposing armies face each other, and the battle is about to begin, and Arjuna is faint in heart, oppressed with the senselessness of this struggle and of internecine warfare. And the Gita says in the first chapter, he was overcome with great compassion and uttered this in sadness. When I see my own people arrayed and eager for fight, O Krishna, my limbs quail, my mouth goes dry, my body shakes and my hair stands on it. And I see evil omens, O Krishna, nor do I foresee any good by slaying my own people in the fight. I do not long for victory, O Krishna, nor kingdom, nor pleasure. Of what use is kingdom to us, O Krishna, or enjoyment? And having spoken thus on the field of battle, Arjuna sank down on the seat of his chariot, casting away his bow and arrow, his spirit overwhelmed by sorrow. And to this complaint his charioteer, the Lord Krishna, replies, Whence has come to thee this state, this dejection of spirit in this hour of crisis? It is unknown to men of noble mind. Yield not to this unmanliness, O Arjuna, for it does not become you. Cast off this petty faint-heartedness, and arise, O oppressor of the foes. And to give point to his words, Krishna goes on. Thou grievest for those for whom thou shouldst not grieve, and yet thou speakest words about wisdom. Wise men do not grieve for the dead, nor for the living. Never was there a time when I was not, nor thou, nor these lords of men, nor will there ever be a time hereafter when we shall cease to be. As the soul passes in this body through childhood, youth, and age, even so is it taking of another body. The sage is not perplexed by this. 
heat and cold, pleasure and pain come and go and do not last forever. These learn to endure. The man who is not troubled by these, O chief of men, who remains the same in pain and pleasure, who is wise, makes himself fit for eternal life. Of the non-existent, there is no coming to be. Of the existent, there is no ceasing to be. The conclusion about these two has been perceived by the seers of truth. Know thou that that by which all this is pervaded is indestructible. Of this immutable being, no one can bring about the destruction. It is said that these bodies of the eternal embodied, which is indestructible and incomprehensible, come to an end. Therefore fight, O Arjuna. He who thinks that this slays, and he who thinks that this is slain, both of them fail to perceive the truth. This one neither slays nor is slain. He is never born, nor does he die at any time. Nor having come to be, does he again cease to be. He is unborn, eternal, permanent, and primeval. He is not slain when the body is slain. Now it's obvious, I think, to those of you who have listened to any other of these programs, what Sri Krishna is talking about here. When I was talking to you about the Upanishads, I explained at several points the fundamental doctrine of the Hindus. And that is that the innermost reality of man is not quite, quite what we who have been brought up in a Christian tradition called the soul. We have an inherited teaching, of course, of an immortal and individual soul, which is the root principle of every human being. But in the Hindu doctrines, the soul is not individual. The soul is supra-individual, or as they would say in their technical language, the Atman, the soul or self. Self is really a better translation than soul. The Atman is identical with Brahman. And Brahman is the name which they use for the ultimate reality which underlies this whole universe. Now, I don't want you to think of Brahman as a sort of vast blob of perfectly transparent jello which penetrates the whole world. I, I think that's what many people imagine when they hear this kind of thing. The whole point of the Brahman idea is missed. When you form any image of it in your mind at all, even jello, even empty space or boundless light, Brahman is what we ourselves really are, what this whole universe is fundamentally and actually. There is no way of thinking about, of imagining that. For the very simple reason that as water cannot rise higher than its own level, thought cannot think what is higher than thinking. It cannot conceive the mind which thinks, and still less, the power which generates the mind. <laughs> 